The Golden Amazons of Venus by John Murray Reynolds from Planet Stories, Winter 1939 as found on Project Gutenberg read by Julie Hoverson The spaceship Viking 200 feet of gleaming metal and polished duralite lay on the launching platform of New York City's municipal airport. Her many portholes gleamed with light. She was still taking on rocket fuel from a tender, but otherwise all the final stores were aboard. Her helicopters were turning over slowly, one at a time, as they were tested. In the Viking's upper control room, Jerry Norton and Steve Brent made a final check of the instrument panels. Both men wore the blue and gold uniform of the interplanetary fleet. Fatigue showed on both their faces, on Steve's freckled pan and on Jerry Norton's lean face. Jerry, in particular, had not slept for 36 hours. His responsibility was a heavy one, as commander of this second attempt to reach the planet Venus from Earth. Well, he would have a chance to catch up on sleep during the long days of travel that lay ahead. The two officers finished their inspection and strolled out onto the open deck atop the vessel. For a while, they leaned on the rail, staring down at the dense crowds that had thronged the airport to see the departure of the Viking. In this warm weather, the men wore only light shorts and gaily colored shirts. The women wore the long dresses and metal caps and thin gauze veils that were so popular that year. Around the fringes of the airport stood the ramparts of New York's many tall buildings, with the 400-story bulk of the Federal Building a giant metal finger against the midnight sky. "'When are we going to pull out, Chief?' Steve Brent asked. "'As soon as the ship from Mars gets in and Olga Stark can come aboard.' "'Funny thing, I've never been able to like that gal,' Steve said. Jerry smiled faintly. That puts you in the minority from all reports. However, that's aside from the point. She's the most capable space pilot in the whole fleet, and we need her. What's she like personally? Tall, dark, and beautiful, with a nasty tongue and the temper of a fiend, Steve said. He yawned and changed the subject. You know, I've just been wondering what really did happen to the stardust. Jerry shrugged without replying. That was a question that was bound to be in the minds of all members of this expedition whether or not they put it in words. Travel between Earth and Mars had been commonplace for more than a generation now, but there had not yet been any communication with Venus, that cloud-veiled planet whose orbit lay nearer the Sun than that of Earth. Two years ago, the exploring ship Stardust had started for Venus. She had simply vanished into the cold of outer space and never been heard from again. Jerry Norton thought the Viking would get through. Science had made some advances in these past two years. His ship would carry better rocket fuel than had the Stardust, and more efficient gravity plates. The new Duralite hull had the strength to withstand a terrific impact. They would probably get through. If not, well, he had been taking chances all his life. You didn't go into the interplanetary service at all if you were afraid of danger. There comes the ship from Mars now, Steve Brent said, suddenly pointing upward. A streak of fire like a shooting star had appeared in the sky far above. It was the rocket blast of the incoming space liner. Yellow flames played about her bow as she turned on the reverse rockets to reduce the terrific speed. The roar of the discharge came down through the air like a faint rumble of distant surf. Then the rockets seized and the ship began to drop down as the helicopters were unfolded to take the weight and lower her easily through the atmosphere. It won't be long now. Steve said in his low, deep, quiet voice. Aye, not long, boomed a deep voice behind them, but I'm thinking it will be a long day before we return to this bra planet of ours. Angus McTavish, chief engineer of the Viking, was a giant of a man with a voice that could be heard above the roar of rocket motors when he chose to raise it. He had a pair of very bright blue eyes and a luxuriant red beard. There were probably no more than a dozen full sets of whiskers worn in the earth in this day and age, and McTavish laid claim to the most imposing. Fuel all aboard, chief, he said. The tender's cast off and we're ready to ride whenever you give the word. Just as soon as these people come aboard. Tell me, Mac, Steve Brent interposed, now that we're all about to jump off into the unknown, just why do you sport that crop of whiskers? 
So I won't have to button my collar, you feckless loon, the big engineer replied instantly. The Scots are a queer race. Aye, lad, the salt of the earth. We remain constant in a changing world. All the rest of you have forgotten race and breed and tradition till you've become as alike as peas in the same pod all over the earth. We of Scotland take pride in being the exception. And in talking like some wild and kilted Highlander of the 20th century, you're out of date, Angus. If you two are going to argue about that all the way to Venus, Jerry said grimly, I'll toss you both out and let you drift around in space forever. Speaking of the 20th century, Steve said, one of the ancient folk who lived in that long ago and primitive time would be surprised if they could see the New York of today. Why, they made more fuss about one of their funny old winged airships flying the Atlantic than we do about a voyage to Mars or the moon. The ship from Mars settled gently down on the concrete landing platform, and her helicopter ceased to turn. From a hundred nozzles along the edge of the platform came hissing streams of water, playing upon the hull that had been heated by its swift passage through the outer layers of the Earth's atmosphere. Then, as the hull cooled, the streams of water died away and the doors opened. The passengers began to emerge. A platoon of police, their steel helmets gleaming in the glow of the lights, cleared a path through the crowd for the small group that hurried across to the waiting Viking. A few minutes later, three newcomers came aboard. All wore the blue and gold uniform of the interplanetary fleet. The two men were Martians, thin and sharp-featured with the reddish skin of their race. The other was an Earthwoman. Olga Stark stood nearly as tall as Jerry Norton's own six feet. She had a pale skin and a mass of dark hair that was coiled low on her neck. Pilot Lieutenant Stark and Flight Ensigns Tanda and Portok reporting aboard, sir, she said quietly. You'll find the officer's quarters aft on B-deck. I'm calling a conference in the chart room as soon as we get clear of the stratosphere. Jerry Norton stood on the little platform at the top of the control room, under a curved dome of transparent duralite that gave him a clear view along the whole length of the Viking superstructure. The last member of the expedition was aboard. The airport attendants had all stepped back. The time of departure had come at last. Close all ports, he snapped. Close ports it is, sir, droned Chester Sand, the safety officer. Warning bells rang throughout the ship. Tiny green lights came winking into view on one of the many indicator panels. All ports closed, sir, the safety officer sang out a minute later. For a moment, Jerry bent over the rail of the platform and himself glanced down the solid bank of green lights on the board. Start helicopters, he ordered. There was a low humming. The ship began to vibrate gently. From his place in the dome, Jerry could see the Viking's dozen big helicopters begin to spin. Faster and faster they moved as Angus McTavish gave his engines full power. Then the ship rose straight up into the air. Here we go, boys. Venus or bust, Steve Brent muttered under his breath, and a low chuckle swept across the control room. The lighted surface of the airport fell swiftly away beneath them. The myriad lights of New York were spread out like a jeweled carpet in the night, dwindling and seeming to slide together as the drive of the Viking's powerful motors carried her steadily upward. At the 3,000-foot level, they passed a traffic balloon with its circle of blue lights, and the signal blinker spelled out a hasty, Good luck! At the 30,000-foot level, they passed an inbound Oriental and Western liner, bringing the night mail from China. She hung motionless on her helicopters to let the Viking pass, her siren giving a salute of three long blasts while her passengers crowded the decks to cheer the spaceship. After another 10,000 feet, they were above ordinary traffic lanes. The glass windows of the control room were beginning to show a film of condensing moisture, and Steve Brent brought the heavy, Duralite panes up into place. Stand by rocket motors, Jerry commanded. Stand by to fold helicopters. Ready? Contact. There was a muffled roar. The Viking's nose tilted sharply upward. Momentarily, the spaceship trembled like a living thing. Then she shot ahead while the helicopters dropped down into recesses within the hull and Duralite covers slid into place over them. Jerry climbed down from the dome into the main control room. Momentarily, he glanced at the huge brass and steel speed indicators. 1,200 miles an hour,' he said. 
fast enough for this density of atmosphere. Hold her there. Summon heads of departments and all deck officers to the chart room. The call was quickly answered. The assembled officers stood leaning against the walls or perched on the chart lockers. Now that the trip had actually begun, uniform coats were unbuttoned and caps laid aside. Angus McTavish had a battered briar pipe clenched in his teeth. The stem was so short that the swirling smoke seemed to filter upward through his whiskers. "'Better be careful, Mac,' said Portok the Martian. "'Maybe the air filters won't be able to handle that smoke of yours.' "'Never mind the air filters, Sonny,' grunted the big Scot with imperturbable good humor. "'They'll handle the smoke of good baccy better than the fumes of that filthy Griqua weed ye smoke on Mars.' A radio loudspeaker had been left on, and they heard the voice of an announcer on some European station. We now bring you a, a brief sports resume. In Canton, China, the Shantung Dragons played a doubleheader with the Budapest Magyars. The score of the first game was... Wonder if they ever heard of baseball on Venus, Steve Brent chuckled. Maybe they'll learn as fast as we of Mars, said Portok. I seem to remember that in the last interplanetary championship series, we... Skip it! Steve growled. I lost a week's salary on that series. McTavish and Portok grinned. Jerry Norton watched them with a smile on his lean, dark face. They were a good crowd. The Viking was going on the most dangerous journey mankind had ever attempted, a journey from which no one had ever before returned alive. But he could not have asked for a better group of subordinates. They were people of his own choosing, and all but two were old shipmates. Though he had never sailed with Chester Sand, the safety officer had been highly recommended. Neither had he ever sailed with Olga Stark before, but he knew her by reputation as an excellent navigator, and when she applied to go, he felt he should accept her. For half an hour, Jerry held them together while he set the watches and checked assignments and outlined other routine details. Then the meeting ended, and only Steve Brent remained with him. They walked forward into the darkened control room, where the only light was the dim glow from the indicator boards. The quartermaster on watch stood motionless beside the steering levers. Jerry noticed that he had a tendency to rise a couple of inches off the floor with each step. The pull of earth was already lessening. He threw the switch that controlled the attraction gear and heard a faint hiss of shifting gravity plates beneath their feet. The feeling and impression of normal weight returned. For a moment, Jerry and Steve stood looking out one of the big duralite windows of the control room. At this level, the legions of stars gleamed with an unreal brilliance in the dead black of the heavens. The earth was a vast globe behind them, glowing for a quarter of its surface with the familiar outlines of the continent still visible. With a lessening pull, the Viking had increased speed to 5,000, but she seemed to be standing still in comparison with the vastness of space. Funny thing, Chief, Steve Brent said meditatively. Olga Stark and Chester Sand are not supposed to have met before they came aboard this ship, but I saw them whispering together in that dark corner off Corridor 6 as I came forward. Maybe she's just a fast worker, Jerry said. For a moment, the incident irritated him, but then he shrugged and forgot it. On a purely scientific and exploratory expedition of this kind, there was no possible motive for any underhand work. The days passed in slow progression. The Viking had attained her maximum speed of 50,000 miles an hour as the ceaseless drive of her great rocket motors forced her ahead, a speed possible in the void of outer space where there was no air to create friction. For all her great speed by earthly standards, she was but crawling slowly across the vastness of interplanetary space. Life on board had settled down to a smooth routine. Now and then alarm bells would suddenly ring a warning of the approach of a small planetesimal or some other vagrant wanderer of outer space, and the ship would change course to avoid a collision. Otherwise, there was little excitement. Astern, the familiar Earth had dwindled to a shining disk, like the button on an airman's uniform. Ahead, the cloud-veiled planet of Venus drew steadily nearer. Passing along one of B-deck corridors one day, Jerry met Olga Stark coming out of the recreation rooms. She was off duty at the moment, and instead of her uniform, she wore a long gown of green silk. Her dark hair was surmounted by a polished metal cap, and a thin gauze veil hung to her chin. Jerry stopped her with a gesture. "'Very decorative, Lieutenant,' he said with a twitch of his lips. 
But this is supposed to be a scientific expedition. I must ask that you wear your uniform outside of your cabin. I am off duty, she retorted, her dark eyes suddenly angry and sullen. It's true that you're not on watch at this moment, but everybody is on duty 24 hours a day till this expedition is over. Resume your uniform. And if I refuse? She asked. You'll go into double irons. When I'm commanding a ship, I do just that. For a moment their glances met, the woman's hot and angry, the man's cold and unyielding. Then, without another word, she swept away to her cabin. Jerry Norton sighed and went on his way. He had never become entirely reconciled to the presence of women in the interplanetary fleet. They made good officers most of the time, but occasionally they had fits of feminine temperament. At last there came the day when the yellowish cloud-veiled mass of Venus filled half the sky ahead. Watches were doubled up. Rocket motors were cut down as the attraction of the planet pulled them onward. Then the forward rocket tubes began to let go for the braking effect, and the flame of the discharges filled the control room with a flickering yellow light. As they entered the outer atmosphere layers of Venus, the effect of air on the sun's rays gave them natural sunlight and blue skies again for the first time in over six weeks. Something about the effect of yellow sunlight slanting in the portholes raised the spirits of all of them, and men were whistling as they went about their work. Jerry brought the ship to a halt a few thousand feet above the endless, tumbled mass of clouds that eternally covered all of Venus. They were now near enough to be fully caught in the rotation of the planet's stratosphere so that they had normal night and day instead of the eternal midnight that had gripped them for weeks. Early the next morning, with all hands on duty, the Viking's helicopters began to drop her down into the cloud mass. The cottony billows swept up to meet them, and then they were submerged in a dense and yellowish fog. Moisture gathered thickly on the windows of the control room. This reminds me of a good London fog, said Angus McTavish, who had come up from his engine rooms for a few minutes. I wonder if they have any good pubs down there. The soupy, saffron-colored fog enshrouded the Viking as she dropped lower and lower. Jerry Norton checked the altitude personally, watching the slowly moving hand of the indicator. Twice, he held her motionless while he sent echo soundings down to make sure they were not too close to land. Then they went a little lower and suddenly came clear of the cloud mass. They were sinking slowly downward through a peculiarly murky golden light that was the normal daytime condition on the planet of Venus. They had arrived. Below them stretched the rippling waters of a vast and greenish sea. It was broken by scattered islands, bare bits of rock that were dotted with a blue moss and were utterly bare of life except for a few swooping seabirds. On a distant shore were lofty mountains whose peaks were capped with snow. In one or two places, a narrow shaft of sunlight struck down through a brief gap in the canopy of eternal clouds, but otherwise there was only that subdued and peculiarly golden light. Nothing moved but those few oddly shaped birds. Lord, but it's lonely, Jerry muttered. There was no sign of human existence, no trace of the towers and buildings of mankind, not even any sign of life at all, except for those seabirds. It was like a scene from the long-ago youth of the world, when the only life was that of the teeming shallows or the muddy shores of warm seas. The place was desolate and forlorn and inexpressibly lonely. They had opened some of the ports for a breath of fresh air after long weeks of the flat and second-hand product of the air filters, with its faint odor of oil and disinfectant. The breeze that came in the open ports was warm and moist and faintly salty. Rocket motors, minimum power, Jerry commanded quietly. There's no use landing on one of those bare islets. We'll see what lies beyond the mountains. The subdued blast of only two rocket tubes began to drive the Viking forward at a slow speed of about 300 miles per hour, while long fins were thrust out at the sides to carry the weight and free the helicopters. All hands were crowded at the windows and ports. After a moment, Olga Stark turned to Jerry. Our magnetic compasses are working again, Captain, she said quietly. I suggest going across the mountains and then turning southwest. Why there, rather than in any other direction, 
Jerry asked quietly. The girl shrugged. Just a hunch. Of course, it's all guesswork. The Viking had to go up to a level of 18,000 feet above this lonely Venusian sea before she was above the peaks of the mountains. Then Jerry turned her inland. Just before they left the shoreline, they passed some sort of a flying thing that swooped down to prey on the seabirds. It had a reptilian body and a spread of leathery wings about 12 feet across. Will you look at that? Steve Brent muttered. I'd hate to meet that on a dark night, Jerry said grimly. Along the shoreline, as they flashed inland, he could see monstrous crawling things that moved sluggishly along the beaches or in the shallows. It began to seem that life on Venus was on a different level than that of the outer planets. The Viking drove steadily westward across the mountains. From the lower control room windows, Jerry could see only drifted snow and naked boulders and the gauntly lonely peaks. The air was thin and cold. The canopy of yellow clouds was only a little way above them. Then, across the mountains at last, they dropped down toward a broad tableland covered with patches of forest and alternate stretches of open grassland. Cut rockets, Jerry snapped. Prepare to land. A few minutes later, the Viking settled gently down in a broad clearing, where the coarse grass was knee-high. For the first time in over six weeks, the sound and vibration of the motors ceased. The expedition had landed on Venus. That was part one of The Golden Amazons of Venus by John Murray Reynolds. From Planet Stories, Winter 1939, as found on Project Gutenberg, narrated by Julie Hoverson.